questions. Okay, so my first question is uh, from the Secret of the Golden Flower book. Yes, I think great book. In page 21, there is this para about stopping and seeing and how they cannot be separated. Okay, good. May I say a few words about this book? Yep, sure. This book really exists in two forms. It exists in the a complete translation, which is here, and a truncated and totally messed up translation that was done by Wilhelm Reich some time ago. And uh, this led to many misunderstandings on the part of Jung, uh, Carl Jung, J-U-N-G. And uh, th therefore, he thought that the... Uh, that certain things that were being referred to as, as I don't know exactly what phrase they used, but primal consciousness, he took to mean the unconscious, which was a grave, grave, grave error. And so that really set back uh, psychology and uh, psychological studies substantially over the last uh, century. And hopefully we'll correct that in this century. So try and get a translation that's complete and hopefully by an illuminated translator because it's a it's a, an illuminated text okay now your questions thank yep, you for letting so me do that questions uh, i think in the page 21 okay page 21 yeah what's the question so so uh, the para starts with the terms stopping and seeing basically cannot be separated correct they mean concentration and insight yes how how is stopping concentration and seeing inside especially how seeing is inside well let's read the entire paragraph okay so let so this is paragraph 16 of uh chapter two and it goes the terms stopping and seeing basically cannot be separated they mean concentration and insight Hereafter, whenever thoughts arise, you don't need to sit still as before, but you should investigate this thought. Where is it? Where does it come from? Where does it disappear? Push this inqu inquiry on and on over and over until you realize it cannot be grasped. Then you will see where the thought arises. You don't need to seek out the point of arising anymore. Having looked for my mind, I realize it cannot be grasped, Quote, I have pacified your mind for you. Very, very Zen. Very, very Zen. In, in, but not in, not in, you know, popular Zen, which is totally misunderstood by the vast majority of people, tragically, uh, in the sense that they think it's just there to do, befuddle you or to, to, to confuse you or to entertain you. It's none of those things. Uh, and so this refers to an old Zen koan where, where, uh, Someone goes to a, a master and says, Master, I, 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 uh, I'm troubled in mind or something like that. And he said, well, bring your mind to me and, and I'll fix it. And uh, then a few months later or something like that, the, the student comes back and says, having looked for my mind, I, cannot, I realize it cannot be grasped. And the, the, uh, the Zen master says, there, I've pacified your mind for you. I've fixed your mind for you. Okay. But your question is more specific and very important. Stopping and seeing cannot be separated. Now, what's your, what's your question exactly? So, first of all, how they cannot be separated? And second of all, what do they mean by saying concentration is stopping and insight is seeing? Okay. Stopping and seeing are two sides of the same coin. So, if you're... If you're, uh, and this actually relates to Carlos Castaneda and also to Krishnamurti, by the way. So, so when you stop, you're, you're basically stopping the, the flow of, of the river of flow of thought in your mind. And so you stop it. You just stop. Now, when you, when you stop that, that torrent of thoughts that usually is there, then you can look at it. It's really the only time you can look at it. It's when you can slow it down or stop it enough to where you can 
Just stop it right there. Boom. Now when it stopped and you look after stopping you see and what you see is insight. I mean that's that is insight. That's clarifying what your mind is like. So that is insight. So stopping and seeing basically cannot be separated. All right. So you con the concentration would be stopping. And seeing would just be looking. Do you see how those are two parts of the same coin? Because if you stop, you can't help but look. But to look, you must stop. So that's called stopping and seeing, and they cannot be un overestimated their importance. In Zen, in Buddhism in general, this is what Krishnamurti means when he talks about stopping the, the incessant flow of thoughts. Can the mind be perfectly still? You know how he talks about that? Can the mind be absolutely perfectly still? You know? And then you have clarity, you know, and then you can, you know, you can think straight, you can be creative for once. Because the mind has stopped and you and it's stilled. So this is literally, I can't think of even in the, the Christian mystics and the in the Christian traditions where they go monastic, especially, they recommend the stilling of the mind. Oh, it's all over the Bible. Be still and know that I am God. Um I can't think of a tradition that ultimately doesn't come down to this. You have to still your mind in order to understand it. These are the most basic okay. instructions, the most stripped down instructions, the, the, the ones that are most fruitful. And, and it's, uh, it's really highly, highly, highly recommended for a reason. Okay, stopping and seeing. Do you think you'll have problems with that? No, like from what I understand, stopping means stopping of conceptual thinking and seeing means seeing things as it is and that can only happen. When right, well, stopping stops. thinking, not just conceptual, all thinking. For a moment, you just stop it. And so you have that power. That's important. You have that power. Just stop it. Wait, so this basically signifies there is something called as non-conceptual thinking. Yes. Okay. What is it like? How can you think non-conceptually? Like? Oh, good question. Good question. Okay, so the question is, what is non-conceptual thinking and how can one think non-conceptually? Every time I try to put this in words, I go to conceptual thought. So it's, it's very difficult to describe, but let me try a metaphor, the metaphor that came to mind. If, you, if we, by analogy or metaphor, say that clouds in the sky are like thoughts, they just, they come, they, they come and then they go, clouds that are moving, right? If we say those are thoughts, non-conceptual thought would be the sky. Or if we take ripples in a river, right? And we say that the ripples are thought, they just kind of keep coming, they keep coming, they keep coming. If the ripples are thought, then the water itself is non-conceptual thought. All right, we're still at the level of the mind. So, so, so thought is like objects so, or let's say we have a perfect mirror and it's reflecting literally nothing. It's hard to imagine, but imagine a mirror that's reflecting nothing. And then we put something in the mirror, that would be a thought. But then when we take the thing away, the clear, unobstructed mirror is the, uh, 
the clear unobstructed mirror is the mind without thoughts. But the mind works by association. So what you reminded me was that my glasses are obfuscated with thoughts. So if I'm looking through clear, clear glass with no thoughts, I see more clearly. Something like that. Does that make sense? I, I can't describe non-conceptual. I don't think I can describe non-conceptual thought. Except to say that it's the matrix of thought. It's the womb in which thoughts, matrix, the womb in which thoughts arise. Or maybe you could say this, maybe thoughts are foreground and the matrix of mind is the background. And so you stop and metaphorically turn the light around and now you're into the, the, the matrix from which thought arises. Does that help? Like, is this something that happens when you are trying to solve a problem? like any mathematical problem and you arrive at a solution but to communicate with others you use conceptual thoughts but the moment you arrive at solution it's like non-conceptual thinking that you have a feeling that you know the solution that may be true for mathematicians I'm not a mathematician I've heard them talk like that but for me it would be easier to say that so a painter understands something and he paints it, and it's problem solved. But if you ask him to articulate the problem, he would have great difficulty unless he was talking to another painter. The same thing's true maybe with a poet. So it may be true for mathematics. I don't know. I'm not enough of a mathematician. But I wouldn't be surprised. But that distinction, just learning that distinction in your own mind, that your your mind, just leave alone any all mysticism, just your mind is made up of at least two parts. One is the content and the other is the substrate. Stopping, turn the light around metaphorically and seeing. Now, once you've practiced enough, you don't need to turn the light around. You just look, stop and look. This is what Don Juan was telling Carlos. And this is what Krishnamurti means when he talks about stilling the mind because the, usually the easiest way for people to do this is by stilling the mind where they can have some control over it. Does that help? Yeah. Yes. Thank Good. That's really, really important. So thank you for bringing that up. That's the, I can't tell you how central that is to everything. I, I, I want to discuss the uh, para 18 as well. Okay, Turning good. Paragraph 18, Secret of Golden Flower, Thomas Clary, translator. What page? Uh, 21. All right. So the para goes, the turning around is stopping. The light is seeing. Stopping without seeing is called turning around without light. Seeing Correct. without stopping is called having light without turning it around. Good. Perfect. Remember this. So in this metaphor, or in these series of instructions, which are very good because they're very succinct and they're good for beginners. Do you wanna, do you have a particular question you want me to address or do you want me to just discuss the paragraph? I just understood what it is, what is being said. Like this in the, I don't know, in the aftermath of, forward i don't remember the name of that section i think thomas tom clary talks about uh, about various ways of turning the light around where one of the master like one of the student uh, where, where one of the master asks a student where he is from yes very does good he, does he like uh, think of the place often yeah think of the place often so so the master as so the master notices a new student 
And he says, where are you from? And the guy said, let's say he says, I'm from Timbuktu. And, and the master says, do you think of Timbuktu often? All right, now go ahead. Tell the story. Yeah. And, and then he says, observe the, and then he talks about how the, uh, the mind can imagine the various valleys, plants and all. When you think of, and, when you think of Timbuktu, are there mountains and buildings and rivers there? Yeah. And the student says, yes. Keep going. Then the master says, who is that thinker who is thinking these things? And I, th I think he says more. I think he says, I'm not sure, but I think he says, now, turn your, now, the thinker who is thinking, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Let's see, it may work this way. Keep going, go ahead. Yeah, so basically master says, think, concentrate on the thinker mm -hmm. who is thinking these images. Mm -hmm. So this is what I feel like turning around is like, master is asking the disciple to stop about whatever is going on, like seeing that image and all. Good, stop. good. And start seeing that, see like, uh, reflect and like put the light on the thinker. I may not be correct. There. Pretty close. Pretty close. So he asked. He asked now. He asked him that you when you remember. Do you remember these buildings and and uh, rivers and and valleys and things in Timbuktu? And the kid says yes. And he says now think about who's doing the thinking. Or turn the right around and look at the source of those thoughts or memories of that place, Timbuktu. And he asks him, are there so many objects there? Are there any objects there? And there's no objects there. That's that's the point. So yeah, you got it, right? That's basically, that, that's not, no, that is the point. What's interesting is that it's entirely a Zen, that's a Zen koan, right? And it's being used in this, which is not particularly Zen at all. Now, <clears throat> I don't think... At any rate, so let's let's go back to this paragraph 18 that you were talking about. That's a good example that you gave. The turning around, so we're going to look at paragraph 16 and 18 at the same time. Okay, so I'm going to read the first line of 16. The terms stopping and seeing basically cannot be separated. They mean concentration and insight or attention and insight. Okay, now we go to 18. The turning around is stopping. The light is seeing. So, insight is seeing. Attention is stopping or concentration is stopping. Stopping without seeing is called turning around without light. So, so you could stop your thoughts, but you don't look. That's not going to help much. It's not bad, but it's not going to help as much. Or... You can see, you can look without stopping. And this is called having light without turning, turning it around. So let's, let's go through both of those. So if you stop without seeing, it's called turning around without light. So, so right now, look at me. I want you to stop your thought. Just stop it. Okay? So that's stopping. That's easy. You can do that for a little while. Stop your thought. But then you have to turn the right around and look where the thoughts are coming from, or maybe they're in front of you. You know, the, the metaphor is to turn the light around. It's it's a useful, but it's it's not about you know front and back, ultimately. Now go ahead and have your all your thoughts. Okay, watch your thoughts run. You know, they're going with my my speech and God knows what else. You know, and just look at them. That's called seeing. So you know how to see and you know how to stop. The trick is to do them both at the same time. And that's why it says, remember this. So you need attention and insight, concentration and insight, stopping and light. Light's another word for attention, the light of attention. Okay, is that clear? It must be crystal clear. So, so you stop and then turn the attention around to the source of thought. Or maybe the thoughts are coming in from here. So you could stop. 
and then look at the source of the thoughts. Or maybe they're in front of you and they're coming at you this way. In which case you stop. I don't want to confuse folks. It's, it may be better just to stick with the turning the light around. But later you'll realize that there's, there's, there's no back and front to this matrix of mind. This womb of mind from in which thoughts arise. Okay, sir? Another question? Good question. Great question. Very central. So this one's from the chapter, Errors in Turning the Light Around. Good. I think it's on page 31. Uh, All right. I think it's para 4. No, I think it is para 4. When you are quiet, it is then essential to find potential and find its opening. Towards it, inside nothingness or indifference, so-called natural whiteness. Yes, this is a common, common error. What's your question? Now that I realize, isn't this what we were discussing earlier? Like it's stopping without seeing. It's, it's stopping and then becoming addicted to stopping. I mean, it may be more than that. What, because this is in the chapter on errors. What page was it again? Uh, 31. Because this is the chapter, chapter on errors, they're trying to warn people. Like there are some Zendos, some Zen places where they just sit for hours and just stare at a wall. That's deviated practice. That's, that's what they've done is they've become addicted to quietude. They sit there and they don't, they don't think, they don't do anything. They just sit there and breathe and, and think that they're making progress, but they're not because they're not, they're not um, growing. They're just stagnant there. Their minds have, have dulled and they, they haven't found the potential, the living potential, which is in all of us, right? So, so in the other metaphors, the, the sky is alive. The, the river is alive. The source is alive. The matrix is alive. And what they do is they stagnate. They sit there and they found a place of peace for themselves. I'm picking on them because they're some of the worst offenders. But this is also true in many other meditation situations where you go and you just sit there for days. And it's important in the beginning to like recognize that you're not your mind and recognize that your mind is somewhat independent and to create some space between the observing self and the, and the contents of mind. That's important. No, no question about it. But then once you've done that, you need to keep going. And the mistake that many places make and many people make, and unfortunately misguided teachers who have not awoken guide their students this way. And that's really a disaster because they, they've mistaken the, uh, a preliminary exercise for the goal. And that's, that's no good. Does that make sense? Yeah, so like main aim of meditation is to always look inside, like to look at who that thinker is. That's the second. Okay, so the first step, you sit in quiet meditation. And this is just so you can settle your mind down enough to realize that, to notice the phenomenology of your mind, the characteristics of your mind. It's constantly moving. It, you know, you don't have much control over it. It, if you don't have something big to think about, it'll think about something small. Uh, there's many characteristics like this. So the purpose of meditation in the beginning is just to get you to slow down enough to where you realize that you are not your mind and your body. Or let's say your mind for now, okay? Now, once you've got that, now you move to the secret of the golden flower and you look for the source of awareness itself, right? And the metaphor that's used is that you turn the light of attention around and you look at the, the, the sky or the, the river, not the ripples, or the, the, the matrix of, of thought itself, of mind itself. Then you keep going. I mean, this is not the end. This is just, you know, this is... And now you do this whether you're walking, sitting, cooking, mowing the lawn, whatever. You can turn the light around and you realize that you can meditate 24-7. Well, I guess you can't really meditate while you're sleeping and not dreaming, technically. But you can, you can 
developed this as a habit and now you're meditating all day, but you're not sitting on your butt in some zendo somewhere or in some meditation retreat. You're going about your day and doing your work and, and now you develop some, some real capacity and some real strength, okay? Got it? Great. Wait, isn't this what similar to what Rupert Svira says about being aware of awareness? I think, okay, first of all, I don't know exactly. I like Rupert a lot, but being aware of awareness, what's being aware? That's the problem. What's being aware would be the question. What's being aware of awareness? And so there's a subtle duality in there that that eventually has to be dropped. I I'm, I'm sure he recognizes that you have to you have to drop that because if you have awareness of awareness, then you've got a duality. And and although that's a a, a decent stepping stone, and poor guy, he's trying to talk to people of all walks of life and all levels of of understanding, right? So yes. I'm not sure exactly what he means, but that duality, well, you got to get rid of that if you're going to see correctly. Yeah. Okay? Yes. All yes. right? Good. Yeah. So the next question is, I tried trying to see my real me, the one that's perceiving all this. And the moment I do that, various thoughts and images come up and then I realize there is something that is perceiving these images itself. So what is it that? And like this kept going on and on mm -hmm. until I realize the, that to see that real me, like I can't see it at all because the moment an image forms up, there is something that is seeing that image. It's, it's like, it's not even blackness, it's not even darkness, it's not even lightness, it's like, it's formless, you can't, you can't describe it at all and, like, do you get what I'm trying to say? Because the moment I form an image, means something is seeing that image. So now I need to go Does deeper. it? And. Does it mean that? Ask the question. Like, my I understand does, what you're saying, and I understand why you're saying it, but that's it's very uh, good because you're on the verge of discovering something very, very important. Literally, you are. You're on the verge of some, discovering something very, vitally important. Keep going. It's like, I, how can you comprehend the formlessness at all? How can you go? How can who comprehend the formlessness? That's just me comprehending myself. Okay, you. So it's, everything's hinging on this me from your point of view or the you from my point of view. Who is this me? Or this you that you keep talking about? Me from my my point of uh, my point of view. Sorry. You from your point of view. What about you from my point of view? Now, presumably, this videotape will play later, right? And people will be hearing your voice. What about you from their point of view? Which you are you talking about, I guess, is another way to do this. By you, I mean the real me. Okay. The, one. the real you, okay? It's the languages, so the real, if I, were, if I were you, I'd be saying the real me. Tell me about this real you, this real me that you referred to. It is observing me speaking to you right now. You just substituted the word it for me. That doesn't help. Okay. Because you could take that sentence and you could say I. 
am just observing. So rather than say it, say I. No? I am observing. Okay. Yes. Tell me about this I that's observing. It can observe. I can observe things that I'm talking about. But now I'm trying to observe myself. I'm trying to observe I. Good. I am not my body. I'm trying to observe myself. That is an image of me observing myself, but that this image is being observed by the real me. So the question again comes, who is doing that? So you have a, a recursive problem because you do a circle with your finger. So that's yep. that you is observing the contents of your thought. But now there has to be a bigger object to observe yep. that circle. Okay, so you've gotten to a, an endless recursion. Is it endless? What happens next? Like if you realize this will go on forever, then it won't be endless because the halting problem. <laughs> the halting problem is that a halting yeah. problem? It's more generic than that, but yeah. Okay. All right. Go ahead. So now what? What I realized is. So if I'm trying to observe myself, I see some qualities of my real self. Or at least I think I can see it. But that is again that real self observing this analysis of the qualities of my real self. And it goes on and on and on. So for me, like what I conclude is I can't like there should not be any objects here. Like if there is any objects that come out of observing my real self, then the real self is observing this generated object. So it keeps on recursing till infinity. Correct. Good. Good. So that means there can be absolutely no objects. But how can you observe some? How can Who you said there has to be no objects? Where'd you get that from? I think I may have conflated it with... It's, le it's legitimate confusion because sometimes these, these, especially the Zen people will talk about nothing there, right? Or sometimes even the, the uh, Vajrayana and others will speak about nothing there. And there is a state of meditation where you can go and you can get to almost nothing there. But that's not what we're looking for. I, I don't know, but somehow I basically, yeah, I thought that, that this real self can't be like can't be like any artifact generated by observing my real self cannot have any object because if it has then real me is again observing that object. but what is the object that's it's an artifact of our language Subject object you're so kind of close. Thing. You're so close. I want to. I almost want to just blurt out the answer, but I, I, you know, that would be cheating you. So you're right at the cusp, right? You just need to keep going and keep trying. 
This is how it works. Good. You're doing good work here. Good. You just need to keep going. And someday it'll just pop. Boom. You'll see. All right. Follow up yes. question or you want another question? Because right here you're going, I mean, if I were to say anything, it would just get in your way. Okay. It, it would literally just get in your way. Okay. Yeah. There's a thousand okay. things I could say, but I don't want to say them right now. So let's change the subject a bit. Okay. But keep going on that yes. line right there. That line right there is the line. That's the one. The recursive one, right? No, the whole problem that you have of when you observe, when, where's a, when there's an object, that's for you, it seems to imply that there's an observer of that object. Yes. Correct? Yes. Keep working on that. Got it. And uh, yeah. it may be time for you to, to go to, uh, have you read much of Dream Conversations? Yeah. I All right. So why don't you go to Instant Zen? Go to this one. If you finish dream conversations, go to this one. And this one we have a uh, this one we have audible for. We have an, a nice audible, which is so rare, and it's so good to have that for uh, a Clary translation, especially this one. There's another one also called the uh, uh, something about the. It's a, just a collection of Zen koans, also well read, but it's much more uh, difficult and, and abstruse. Okay, so so. These two, let's see, where's these two? This one first, yes. and then this one. Got it. All right, good. Yes. Next question. Yeah, so this is a bit unrelated. This is regarding thoughts. And I, have, I don't know how to put it. So like, our thoughts are to brains physical sensations what feelings are to bodies physical sensations like like it's like when you feel pain or when you are anxious about something you know your body is at particular state like your heart is racing your muscles are tense and all what i'm trying to say is are thoughts the same thing but the configurations in your brain it's, are they? I feel like they are. Okay, well, keep investigating. Let me give you a thought. Let me give you a thought. Yabba dabba do. Have you ever heard of yabba dabba do? I have heard of bada bing bada boom, but not of. Oh, you've heard of bada beam, bada boom, but not yabba dabba do. Okay, good. So, bada beam, bada boom will also work. And then watch what happens in your brain when you drop a pebble in like that, like bada beam, bada boom, or yabba dabba do. Maybe it's somewhere stored in my, uh, stored as a memory. And I'm used, whenever I hear that thing, those circuits ramp up. And this ramping up of circuit. The it's very interesting because we haven't found it. In neuroscience, we've been working on it for more than 100 years now. We haven't found anything like that. There was a set of experiments that were done by, um, what was his name? A Canadian neurosurgeon way back in the 50s maybe the 60s, where he stimulated a woman's brain and she would hear parts of a symphony. And uh, that was kind of replicated. It's not clear. It's very hard to get your hands on the literature. Uh, but other than that, mm -mm. it's kind of like the Fermi problem. It's kind of a riot, actually. So these thoughts and these memories, huh? We assume... We assume all kinds of things. We assume that it's all stored in the brain, but then uh, Michael Levin teaches a flatworm some things and then he homogenizes the brain, literally puts it more or less in a blender. And, uh, or he cuts the animal in half, cuts off the head, and then the tail 
grows another head and remembers or knows how to do the task. So that doesn't fit with our models of memories being stored in the, in the, in the brain, in the cortex. And then we have single cell organisms that are quite capable of agentic action and uh, presumably some memory, but they have no, they have no brain, they're one cell. Or, <clears throat> let's see, so we have, his name is Penfield, I think. He would stimulate the brain and he got one woman, maybe, maybe two, and then the replications are very, very sus to uh, experience a symphony. We have uh, flatworms whose, whose brain can be, who can be cut in half and the tail that doesn't include the brain learn, has still learned the task that we're taught, you know, simple task. Then we have single cell organisms with no brain at all that are able to do quite a bit in terms of self-preservation and things like that. And then a real kicker, what was, oh yeah, if you think about a, a caterpillar, a cat, you know, caterpillars and butterflies, you know that story, right? Yes. The caterpillar's brain is basically liquefied before it becomes a butterfly. And the butterfly has a whole different set of things to worry about. It's got to fly in three dimensions. You know, it's not just crawling on a, on a leaf. It's got to fly. And it eats a different kind of food. So where did that come from? And the answer in the 20th century, well, that's all the genes, right? Well, we know that that's not the case. It's much more complex than that. Even the human body only has like 20,000 proteins coded for by the, by the genome. That's not very many. And then three times, four times that number that are modified by experience in the, in the cell or in the uh, interstitial space or in, in, in uh, the environment. So we don't have any science. So we imagine that we have answers to these questions, but we don't. <clears throat> now, these are going to be fascinating issues for thoughtful people going forward because the machines are going to be able to think and remember far better than we can. So this should be a lot of fun. I'm sorry, I got off, off, I got off into yeah. science. Uh, where were you talking about? Yeah, uh, thoughts being basically... Yeah, if I say, if I say uh, yabba dabba do, your brain associates to bada bing and then bada bing has a whole other train of associations in your, in your, and you're presuming they're in your brain, which maybe they are, or certainly the, the, certainly the brain is a transducer. We know that much, right? The brain is essential for human consciousness. That much we do know for human consciousness with a small c. Yeah. Okay, sir? So, so, as you're doing everything else, you can contemplate, well, well, that's an interesting feature of my brain. It immediately goes by association. So I could say one thing, yabba dabba do, and you take that and immediately go to bada bing, and then bada bing, I have associations, you have associations, I, w I hope they're the same ones, but we don't know. And so it is with all language, right? Fascinating. Okay, next question. Before we start winding up. Uh, yeah, so my next question is, so I feel pain like everyone else. And mm -hmm. I feel like pain is just firing of neurons and other things as well, but physical things. And that basically leads me to feel pain. Okay. But how is my awareness able to sense these signals if I'm not my body? Well, th what you're pointing to is the hard problem of consciousness. Uh, no one said you were not aware of your body, or you, that you wouldn't that that you know you could your body couldn't feel. And no one said that. But how is awareness able to feel these things? A medium. Well, that's, that's just basic, that's, 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 now that we do have worked out, but, but, okay, so, so that you just need to review 
pain receptors and heat receptors and things like that and the nerves that go and tissue damage and inflammation you're shaking your head yeah. Yeah, so I agree with that. That's a okay, good. But then let me point out something else that might be useful. There are certain things that would be called pain by some people that are called pleasure by others. Have you ever had someone really mash really hard on your ankles, around your, your malalis, around the bones there? For older people, yeah. that, that can, it can either hurt or it can feel exquisite. Or shiatsu, like really hard pressure in certain places. So the pain description much depends on the, uh, the associations of the person receiving it. But that's not what you're asking about. What you're asking about is a hard problem of consciousness. How are qualia possible? Uh, would you say that your pain is different than that of a, uh, a sheep who has its foot caught in a, I don't know, in a, on a piece of wire or something? I, I, it's totally different and this is like asking whether what I see color red is that same way you see the color red as well like maybe in your world you may be seeing it in green can you think of an experiment that could answer that uh, I don't think so like, correct I'm, correct so this yeah. is a problem for the physicalists right that's the problem for the people who believe that the world is made up of physical things and then we have consciousness which is clearly not physical right awareness itself and they have to somehow or another jump from the the physicality of things to the clear this is descartes problem too right this is this is an age age old problem it's solved but they don't want to accept the solution so let's let's narrow down on your question though because it was about pain well, is it about pain or any sensation? Any sensation, to be honest. My, my okay, when you say pain, you know, I'm a doctor and I, or I used to be on one on TV or whatever. Ha <laughs> ha. So, 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 scrap that. I'm not a doctor. I, I uh, used to be one. So when you say pain, that sets off all kinds of associations to me. So let's go to some other sensation. Great. Happy to. Yep, so, like... Let's go to feeling tense, your muscles being tense about things or stretched and all. That feeling, right? How is that feeling sensed by awareness? Your awareness or your body? Because I can do the same thing with a single-celled organism, remember? The lacrima, whatever you call yes. it. Have you seen those... Uh, it's called lacrim or something or other. It's a single-celled organism with a big proboscis, a big nose, and it can it can sense tension, you know, in the in the water or you know in the in the ionic atmosphere of, of the water. So I don't know if you're talking about specific human things or you're talking about sensation in general. Uh, any sensation. Uh, my basic thing is how is like. If something were to happen to my hand, like I'm moving my hand, how is my awareness aware of my movement of hand? First, you need to know that your, your, your awareness may not be aware of it. For example, if your finger touches something hot, before the pain can even reach your brain, your finger has already moved, right? Or if, if your, the doctor taps your knee with a, with a hammer, that knee moves, it senses the tension and responds before it goes to your brain. So you may not be aware of it all. Your CO2 levels could go down and you'll just start breathing more deeply and or go up and you start breathing more deeply without being aware of anything at all. So it's not, a, there's nothing like you need to be aware of sensations in order to function, right? So accept that fact first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. You've got too much potassium in your blood. Your kidneys say, hey, we got too much potassium in here. We don't like that for the, for the, we don't know, understand how it does this, how, how it thinks. It says, we want to keep things cool for the guys upstairs. So let's, let's piss out some more potassium. So there's a lot of things like that. So the question then becomes, why are you aware of some sensations and not in others? Right? And then the next question is, 
well, let's leave pain and sensation out of it. Let's just take the color red, you know, perception. Yes. What's your question? My question is still this, how is my awareness able to see color red? Like how is my physical body you don't need awareness to see red. I can I can create a photoreceptor. I mean, uh, uh, Tesla's got cars that see red and see green and see yellow, and they act right. So that you don't need awareness for that. Clearly. So the question is why, or or so so, we can go down the rabbit hole of the hard body problem, but it, the problem is poorly phrased especially for you, because you're trying to get to the root of everything, right? And I don't want to spoil it. Don't get too intellectual about this, although you can later, or if you want, you can do it now. It's a lot of fun, and there's nothing better to think about in my world, because I mean, what could be more cool than trying to understand understanding itself, and perception, and sensation, and consciousness, and suffering, and pain, and joy, and all this. It's just so rich. But we're going to have to stop for today. So any last questions? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, no. Don't yeah, these are these are beautiful questions, and it shows you you're on the right track. But in the beginning, you had even better questions because those will actually have a huge yield, right? When you break through, when you yeah. wake up with a poo, and just keep going. That's all you got to do, my friend. Just keep going. All right, sir. Yes. Anything up before we stop? Uh, no. All right. Keep the faith. Good job. Keep going. Ciao.